Right then, welcome back. Still breakfast central on News Central with Olisa Chukuma and Tululokwe at Delaru Balogo. We go straight now to our second conversation, impact conversation of the day, and it's all about you know the mother tongue and a big one with the theme fostering multilingualism uh, for inclusion in education and society. Our 2021's International Mother Language Day uh, recognizes that languages and uh, multilingualism can advance inclusion and the SDGs focus on leaving no one behind. And what we also know is that UNESCO's chief, Audrey Azoulay, described this year's focus as being essential because when 40% of the world's inhabitants do not have access to education in the language they speak, or understand best, it hinders their learning as well as their access to heritage and cultural expressions. Uh, with the pandemic that has threatened cultural diversity as festivals and other events have been cancelled, and with the impact affecting creators and the media, she also called for special attention to be paid to multilingual education from early childhood as the mother tongue is always an asset. Mm. So quite a big one, you have to say Africa is the most linguistically diverse continent in the world. According to UNESCO, uh, people speak close to 2,000 different languages, which is uh, a third of the world's linguistic heritage. Uh, but uh, up to 300 languages have less than 10,000 speakers, which puts them on the UN's list of endangered languages. And 37 are in danger of completely dying out in the next few years. Now, 52 have uh, already you know, gone completely extinct. Our guest uh, today is uh, Kola Tsubosu, Nigerian linguist, writer, translator, scholar, and cultural activist. His work and uh, influence span the fields of education, technology, uh, literature, journalism, and also linguistics. Kola, good morning to you. Good me. Hello, Kola, are you there? I am. Okay. <laughs> morning, Paula. Morning. All right. Good morning. Morning, <laughs> Thank Paula. you for having me here. Welcome to Breakfast Central. Now, languages with their complex, you know, implications for, for identity, communication, and social integration, education and development are quite strategic uh, and important for people and the planet. But due to, you know, globalization processes, they are increasingly under threat or perhaps disappearing altogether. Now, in Africa, we just talked about it, about 52 languages have completely gone extinct. What were the circumstances that led to these languages going extinct? Yeah, um, well, the, the extinction of languages is something that typically happens anyway. Um, just like uh, it could, you know, biodiversity, you have animals going extinct, um, sometimes due to natural causes, uh, sometimes due to human intervention. Uh, in the language space, um, it's been accelerated by the issues of globalization, and um, you know, uh, colonialism, etc., uh. um, and other issues: war, um, domination, um, uh, the influence of bigger languages on smaller ones. Uh, but since um, colonialism, since we have been um, compelled to adopt English as a means of communication between uh, ethnic groups in Nigeria, many uh, language communities have abandoned, totally abandoned their own languages. Um, and some just died off because, you know, they don't have access to, um, you know, the bigger languages around them have totally subsumed uh, their languages. Um, and, you know, only the bigger languages get prominent. You know, in Nigeria, we talk about three major languages, whereas there are several languages, over 500 languages in Nigeria. So um, this combination of issues, uh, globalization, modernization, um, lack of... Um, you know, uh, pride in one's language and culture. There are people who choose themselves not to speak their own language. There are some people compelled to because of the influence of bigger languages around them, uh, mm -hmm. etc. So there are a number of issues that uh, uh, contribute to this uh, language extinction. So in all honesty, someone might look like it's a language. Once you're able to communicate with others in maybe the, as we look at English, the main lingua franca for many of us, then nothing is lost. But there are those who really do believe that once a language is lost, mm. something is lost. There's something that is taken away from society or from a country mm -hmm. or from a tribe. So if anything, Kola, tell us, what would be lost when a language dies, when language goes extinct? Um, what, what, what do we lose? Yes, we lose so much. We lose a worldview, a total worldview. Uh, language encompasses more than just a means of communication. It's a worldview. So I pointed out this example with an interview uh, a couple of days ago that um, in Yoruba, you know, when we say um, labor, when we want to describe labor, a woman going to labor, we talk about Ojoy Kule. 
which describes the physical act as well as the events of giving birth to a child, the physical act of kneeling down. Uh, when you think about you know, the process of giving birth today in the hospital, you think of people lying down a gurney or in a bed, um, and that posture is a Western uh, intervention. You know, people never used to give birth that way. And there's, you, there was no way you would know that um, if the language Yoruba has not encoded that uh, mm. physical act of kneeling down you know, as, as, as a posture. That's just one example. The different other languages uh, encompass different ways of living. And so when one language dies, you lose not just the means of communication, but just the whole worldview and many other ways of dealing with the world. The way people heal themselves with herbs, the way people educate their children, the way people um, deal with natural disasters, et cetera. So uh, when we lose the language, we also lose several of those um, uh, cultural uh, and, and viewpoints mm. uh, of these particular people who speak the language. All right, Kola. Now, the role of African languages in education and learning has been, you know, hotly debated topic for decades. Even as early as the late, uh, you know, 1800s, you know, missionary educators in colonial Africa were convinced that, you know, local languages were key to effective learning. Now, the controversy on, you know, issuing, using the mother tongue in early childhood education is still one. Where do you stand on this one? Um, so, there is no language that is better than the other. Mm. There's no language that is more competent than the other. It's, a language is just a tool, and it is what we make of it that makes it what it needs to be. So uh, Albert Einstein, for instance, who many people will think of immediately when you think of genius, spoke German as a first language, mm. and until he had to migrate to the US, he didn't have any need to speak English. All the work he did then mm. in, in his German language were as valid as the ones he eventually did when he started learning to speak English and you know, became an American. It's the same way with African languages. There's nothing wrong inherently in using them to teach, to do wow. science, to do mathematics, to do a number of things. Uh, mathematics used to be, uh, Arabic used to be language of mathematics, for instance, before it became English. So yeah. every of those things um, you know, show that there's nothing inherently wrong. So the, the, what has been wrong is that we have been compelled mm. uh, to use only English um, which is ironic. The, the irony out of it, actually, for me, is that when British were around, actually, they encouraged the use of local languages mm. in education. Uh, many of the books that were published in the fifties, Fagunwa, for instance, were published by publishing houses that were manned by British and colonial people. So, uh, the irony is that is after the British left that we decided ourselves mm. not to pay attention to uh, using language in education, using language in politics, using language. Um, to to do the things that we typically did. Uh, so Kola, that's, that's the crazy aspect. Kola, you know, it, it, yeah, it's interesting you talk about the irony of when perhaps the colonial powers left mm -hmm. and uh, we decided, when you talk about we, the colonial people, whether it's French colonies in uh, Francophone Africa, uh, Lusophone Ang Africa or Franco uh, Anglophone Africa. Now, are we saying that perhaps maybe we should have, you know, taught uh, mathematics in local language, mathematics in Yoruba, Mathematics, you know, in Zulu, you know, biology in Igbo, rather than Engli uh, English in biology. Perhaps like the people we see in the Asians, the Chinese, they learn mathematics in Chinese, yeah. biology in Chinese, chemistry in Chinese. Perhaps for better understanding, do we have to go that route? Because sometimes, yes, being that the only language we know that we can read and write and learn in is the colonial language. We don't read and write and learn in the mother tongue. Doesn't that create more mm. like a jar? Well, I understand the argument we make that because Nigeria is a multilingual space, we have mm. about 200, uh, 500 languages, like I said earlier, um, that it might be cumbersome to try to teach everyone in different languages. But the, the, uh, the argument against that is that we never try. Mm. Um, okay. We had money, I mean, we hear every day about how much money has been disappeared into different, you know, weird uh, spaces in the country. So we, we do have the money, and and in places where the uh, experiment has worked, mm. what has happened uh, was that they devolved the responsibility of language policy and educational policy to the regions. Mm. So you would say that you know if 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 a language around you is um, Igbo then use the Igbo around you to teach people whatever they need to learn. Mm -hmm. English language is just a subject. I've been to Wales. Um, they, 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 they teach people uh, in, in school mm -hmm. in Welsh. 
And English is just a subject. So when you get to the English class, that's when you use English, just like we do in French uh, in Nigeria right now. So you, you teach uh, people in the language, use the language of the area to teach the different languages. I don't have a problem with, if I lived in Anambra, for instance, attending schools where Igbo is the means of instruction and I learn all the things I need to learn. It doesn't matter that I'm a Yoruba child because I speak mm -hmm. Yoruba at home anyway. And then Igbo becomes the language of the school, and then English becomes the subject that I learn eventually. So when mm. I grow up, I acquire my own language, I acquire the language of the area, and I acquire English. Mm. Um, but we have bought ourselves into this idea that if you don't use English as a means of instruction, then you're not going to teach anything worthwhile, which mm. is not true because we've seen it in Korea, we've seen it in Israel, we've seen it in Switzerland, and many other places where the local languages are used as a means of instruction. They still students still acquire English as a subject, and as a language, mm. and they learn all the things they need to learn much better. And we've done this experiment also before. Professor Trafkin, what did this in the 70s, that uh, had a pilot of students using the local language Yoruba to learn every subject. And many people who went through the system um, turned out just as sometimes even better prepared to, wow. uh, to understand all the things they need to understand to be. Uh, competence. All right, Kola, we're wrapping up, but I'm going to ask you a twofold question because as we're seeing some languages go extinct and become endangered, there's also the creation of new languages. In Kenya, we have Sheng, which is a mixture of English, Swahili, and mother languages, and this has emerged in the past few years. Now, in terms of this conversation of preserving culture and heritage, where do we place these uh, languages that are coming about and sort of taking dominance? I would even say, in a way, Pidgin is a language that has it spread and it's it is spoken across Nigeria has even permeated into other parts of West Africa and in some places if you don't speak Pidgin you won't get things done so mm. where do we place the emergence of some of these new languages and in all of this how do we encourage people to hold on to their mother tongues and everything that comes with it the benefits of ensuring that our children learn English in school eventually but speak their mother language at home and we ensure that our society doesn't lose out in the long run mm. I'm glad you mentioned pidgin because pidgin is a language the Nigerian language uh, so is patois in Jamaica and so is Nigerian English which is also emerged as a different kind of English than the British English. Yeah. Um, these are languages evolve all the time. Like I said, the, the extinction of language and the invention of new languages are some things that always happen. Um, what we do as linguists is just to try as much as we can to hold on to the worldview, the knowledge, the things we can hold on to in the languages that already exist and prevent extinction as much as possible and celebrates the invention of new languages if possible as well because the ultimately the most important thing is that uh, you know language is a means of communication it's a way of making sure that people can express themselves and express themselves in the best way possible i always recommend uh, mentioned this a number of times that uh, as a multilingual country, Nigeria has, you know, uh, at, the, at the policy level failed, not just internally, but also externally. Uh, we have presidents who speak, uh, you know, Nigerian languages, but go abroad and then start speaking English uh, to foreign journalists. Most Western uh, presidents and leaders don't do that. Uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Vladimir Putin, they speak their own mother tongue, and when they are interviewed abroad, even though they speak English and they understand it, they respond in their own language. It's a way to show that this is a language I'm proud of and this is the language of my country. Now, it's controversial because many people assume that I'm saying, um, you know, dominate us with your own language. But because we've had presidents from different language communities all the time, it's something that changes, that's going to continue to change. So during the Jonathan, for instance, when he goes to America to have interviews, he should speak Ijo uh, and let the, the people there find a translator okay. to translate it um, and we will understand it because it will be translated as well. We speak English anyway, but let him speak in language he's comfortable with. When mm. Buhari goes abroad, let him speak Hausa, we will have it translated. Because in the end, he's more comfortable in that language. Uh, we had a minister, I think, a couple of days ago say, uh, bandits are different from criminals. Again, that might make sense to him in his mother tongue. He might be trying to say something else, but I don't understand it in English because it makes no sense. So let mm -hmm. people speak in the language they're most comfortable with. Let us translate it, get translators. You give job to translators abroad, mm -hmm. who are Nigerians who get to do the job to interpret this. Um, and foreign countries typically always transcribe Nigerian presidents' words anyway, yeah. even when you speak in English, because their accents are too thick. So mm -hmm. you win uh, in many ways by doing that. And then you project the multilingual nature of the country, because mm -hmm. the president comes today, he speaks Hausa. Four years' time, there's another president speaking Yoruba abroad, I mean. Um, and all these foreign countries understand that Nigeria is a multilingual country. It doesn't make us less in the eyes of the world. Mm. Clinton does it, 
Merkel uh, does it, uh, et cetera. And of course, finally, we all ought to speak our own languages to our children and encourage them to be able to speak it and use it in the di different ways they can. Uh, there's nothing inherently terrible about speaking your own language. It's mm -hmm. actually the language you're born into and you know, there's nothing wrong with it. So uh, those are the suggestions I have. Uh, all right. And eventually I think we also should put some policies in place um, to encourage uh, multilingual diversity and use in the country. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Kola Tupusu. Linguist, scholar, cultural activist, you know, uh, also delving into literature and even journalism. Thank you so much for joining us on Breakfast Central. My pleasure. All right. right. Wow, this conversation is a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, if I say anything, you can, uh, you'll say it's, it's not it's okay. Just like you said, we are the ones that somehow uh, the uh, colonial, con colonized countries. Uh, that uh, when the people left, we decided to adopt their country. How many of what you? Is uh, uh, what is Anglophone? What is Lusophone? What about our local language? I want to uh, learn. Uh, my, uh, I want to learn biology in my language. Mm. That's so much to ask. Mm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> They've said only I respond now. He's hearing, but he's not responding. Don't worry. I, my director is trying to be very cheeky. <laughs>